Luke 16, beginning of verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. The one rose from the dead. These are the words of Jesus while he was in the flesh teaching. And some insist that this is just another one of those parables that Jesus taught. And Jesus did use parables, but this one is really different than the parables. A parable was typically a comparison or lesson taught from everyday common occurrences, as most of us are familiar with. A farmer went out to sow his seed. That's a physical occurrence that happened every day where they could see it. And then the Lord Jesus used that to teach spiritual principles from that. A landowner and his servants Here, Jesus names one of the men involved. He doesn't identify it as a parable. When Jesus' disciples asked why he taught in parables, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 13, 11, because it is given unto you, talking about those who are seeking, his disciples that want to know, it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them speak I in parables, because they seeing see not, Hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So Jesus explained why he taught in parables, because they were tools of Jesus to hide and disguise truth from those who weren't hungering and thirsting after it, but those who wanted it and had that connection with God could clearly see what the Lord was teaching. Parables were tools of Jesus to hide spiritual truths in physical illustrations, but this account is different, isn't it? In Luke 16, we're given a look beyond the physical, a look beyond the earthly. We're allowed to see what happens after death. I don't think it's veiled. I don't think you have to say, I wonder what he's teaching through this. I think everyone could understand exactly what he's teaching through this arranged conversation set up for our learning. And these are not hidden truths, they are reality. And we didn't read uh, verse 18 of Luke 16, but look at it for just a moment, the verse that precedes where we started. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery may seem to be unrelated, but as I looked at that, I thought about a man putting away or divorcing his wife simply for greener pastures. That's really the context. It's not about those who are being abused and all the sinful past and all the complications that we have to deal with. 
uh, in divorce, he's talking about present tense, somebody saying, I want that, and I'm going to have it. All I need to do is get a writing of divorcement. Jesus says, I don't recognize that when you do it that way and for that reason. But greener pastures. Uh, Jesus, again, wasn't addressing all those other things. But this is how God views divorce that is for me or for self. I don't look at it. I don't honor it. You're not pulling the wool over my eyes because we think it's greener on the other side, don't we? And I'm here to say it's not greener on the other side. Not that I've experienced it, (laughs) but I've seen enough heartache as a result of that. You ever look at your neighbor's yard from your angle when the sun's coming your way? That yard looks so green and beautiful. What's wrong with mine? It just looks better over there. Jesus then tells us about a man who ever had everything in this life the way he wanted it. But what will it mean when this short earthly existence is over? What will it mean uh, when a man just for... His own pleasure abandoned his home and his family and his wife. What will it look like in eternity? What will it mean when this life is over? As Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26, What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? His fleeting desire for the perfect woman or the perfect family. What kind of regret would be there? Those deceptive, greener pastures. And so out of mercy, Jesus pulls back the curtain and lets us see something about what happens afterwards. In Luke 16, 19, it says, There was a certain rich man clothed in the finest of clothes because purple represented the finest in that day. It was rare. It was expensive. He had fine linen the best materials all around him, the best of everything. And he ate the best of food. He fared sumptuously every single day, the finest clothes, the best transportation that would make people stop and stare, the finest foods, luxurious surroundings, killer vacations, Facebook pages that would make everyone jealous and feel less than can't compete with that. But then on the other hand, Lazarus was laid near this man's grand estate, hoping for some crumbs, maybe digging through the trash to see what these wealthy people had thrown away, begging for a few crumbs. And it says the dogs, which were, they still are unclean. We view them a little differently in our society, but these Wild, unclean animals came and licked his sores, just telling us how miserable he was. This is a godly man, obviously, because he ends up in heaven. This is a godly man knowing that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. This is a suffering man that from an earthly standpoint There was no rhyme or reason to his pain. And we've been sold a bill of goods if we think that every suffering is something God uses for some earthly good. Because I tell you, I've been with a lot of people who suffered a lot and then died. And no earthly good came to them for their suffering. You may never see an earthly reason or benefit for the suffering that you're going through. But God is working it all for his eternal good, and he invites you to be a part of it. It may end horribly for you on this earth. And don't let that shake your faith. If you end up in the worst of conditions and it never turns out any better than that here on this earth. Yes, in a society dominated by godly principles, There are earthly benefits, and I am not speaking against that today because I've seen it. Like what David noticed in that 
God-given society that he was head of. Psalm 37, 25, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. He was talking about these godly principles at work in a godly society where God is honored. And we've seen some of those benefits in America. I know growing up in America, I did not fully appreciate the benefits of this society that we've lived in. Where I just turn the tap on and there's always water. I open the refrigerator, there's always food. I thought I was hungry, but I've never been hungry. Longer lifespans, healthy, unpolluted environments, mentally stable people. And there are people who love the Lord who are stressed in this world, and there are people who love God who are suffering mentally in this world, and there's no shame in that, and God is the answer, even in the midst of that suffering. Lasting, secure prosperity in this country. It came as we grew in godly principles, as we implemented godly principles. Whether we believed them or not, we were influenced by them. It was societal pressure to live that way, and it makes a difference. But where evil is present, these principles are interfered with. You can do everything right, and a drunk driver kill one of your loved ones. It really frightens me, and this is not in my notes, how casual we have become with alcohol in the church of Jesus Christ today. I'm not here to bring judgment against anybody, but let God bring it and conviction. Everybody said, pray for the graduating seniors because they're going to do stupid things. They don't have to. I graduated from high school without getting drunk. I praise the Lord for that. Without drugs. I've known people who did and they paid the price. But God's grace is sufficient to lift them out of whatever they're suffering. But where evil is present, these principles are interfered with. You can do everything right. A drunk driver can kill a loved one, kill you. A godless, brainless moron with a gun can take innocent lives in the world in which we live. Ephesians 6, beginning with verse 1, reminds us of the very first commandment that came with an earthly promise. Listen to it without turning there. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. What if you have an abusive mother and father? This is not talking about that. This is talking about how God designed things to work. Honor your parents in the Lord. That's key, in the Lord, not out of the Lord. For this is right, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth, and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It says this is the first commandment that came with an earthly promise. If you'll live this way, you're going to live longer on the earth. You're going to have less mental stress. You're going to have all of these safety uh, things happening in your streets, if you live this way. And that's what godly principles do. And it's a powerful evidence of God and His wisdom. If we do it His way, what happens? If we turn from His way, what happens? And so much of what we are seeing going wrong is that we have rejected God's design for human society. And you may be living that way and everything go wrong because of an environment that isn't honoring God. We may do it all right and be victims of a senseless crime. Fathers are provoking their children to wrath. And as we study child abuse prevention for camp, it's one of the required things that we have to go through. A state certified child abuse prevention program, the person who is presenting the one I was listening to Cindy's. I still got to go through it myself. It said, Our society 
is plagued because of abuse. Our society is plagued because of abuse. Fathers are provoking their children to wrath. And yeah, you can do that through abuse. You can do that through many things. And one of the things I tell dads, don't give kids a standard they can't meet because you'll only anger them. God doesn't do that. Dads don't do that. Show them you can be pleased and that your standards are achievable easily. God help us. All we know about Lazarus here in Luke 16 is that he is diseased, abandoned, and desperate and begging. And yet he ends up in heaven. He was a child of the living God. No earthly at rescue came for him. He, like Job, though, could say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If you're looking for absolute promises of abundance, prosperity, and health in this life, you will not find them in holy writ. But you shall find this one in 2 Timothy 3.12. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's a promise that's all-inclusive. If you'll live godly in this ungodly world. You shall suffer. Or Romans 8, 17, we are joined heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Are we willing to suffer with him? Obviously, Lazarus was willing to suffer with the Lord Jesus, no matter what caused his circumstances. There may never be a purpose for your suffering beyond the fact that God is revealing Himself and He's exposing sin for what it really is. There may not be this silver lining. There may not be this earthly aha. Oh, that's why God let me go through that. No, God is revealing Himself and He's exposing sin and we're involved in it. We're involved in it. Even if it's senseless what happens in a sinful environment. Even if it's ungodly, it's definitely not of God. And there's a view of God that is disturbing because it lays at the feet of God the responsibility of all abuse. And he's not responsible. But God threw back the curtain and let let us see beyond the grave. And for our benefit and for the holy angels to learn, God let us see what happens if you allow a glimpse of heaven from hell. In verse 23 of Luke 16, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And Lazarus isn't dead, and in the grave he's in heaven. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And I want you to know he wanted cool for the inside Because we've talked about hell and what scripture talks about hell, the greatest flames of hell are those of regret. Recognizing what I am and where I am for all of eternity. The torment of lost opportunity. And what Lazarus was experiencing, the rich man wanted just a touch of it to cool the pain that he was experiencing. And we've talked about recently the different symbols that God uses for hell, the grave, Hades, the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem, most uh, the word that's translated hell in the New Testament, the lava flow, uh, the consuming, the dross, the, the lake of fire and brimstone, all of those things that God uses as a symbol. But we have that literal description, the blackness of darkness forever. We have in 2 Thessalonians 1.9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. What did Abraham say in this divinely arranged conversation? It's very important. Abraham said in verse 25, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. 
And beside all this, between us, uh, between you and us, there's a great gulf fixed. There's nothing that can be done about it so that they which would pass from here to, to there cannot. And anybody that would want to pass to us cannot. It's permanent. It's fixed. Once this life is over, there's no purgatory. There's no hope to be prayed for. There's no further opportunity. Your loved ones can't pray on your behalf. And God expressly forbids the praying to departed spirits anyway. Jesus and faith in him now is your only hope. Amen. And there's a great expanse, a great gulf fixed. It's permanent between heaven and hell. It's a barrier, a place to separate heaven from the pollutions of sin. And in this divinely arranged scenario where this man in hell is allowed to view heaven, what's his next request in verse 27? Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, since that's the case, since there's no traffic between the two, once you go, you can't come. Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Send Lazarus to my father's house. For there are five brothers that I have, that he may witness to them, lest they come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He's saying, Please keep my family from making the same mistake. When it's too late, he wants his family to know how eternity changes our perspective. And I think eternity needs to change our perspective now before it's too late. Oh, go talk to my brother. Go talk to my sister. Go talk to my child. Go talk to my grandson. Go talk to whoever it is that needs to know him. Before it's too late. What about your loved ones? Good, good question to ask ourselves. And then Abraham reveals something powerful about the word of God. Abraham, verse 29, said, they have Moses and the prophets, talking about their Bible. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went from the dead, they will repent. He said unto, them, if they hear, said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. When you turn your heart toward the word and seek it with all of your heart, it is more powerful and it is more lasting than any visitation from the dead. And that's what he was saying. And we know it's true. The children of Israel saw great miracles and yet they turned away from God in the wilderness. People have seen astounding miracles. They've seen people... Uh, come back from the dead in the Bible, and yet they still sinned against God. He said, the only thing that's going to make any difference is the Word of God in their heart. You turn your heart towards God. It is more powerful and lasting than any visitation from heaven. I don't care how many books they write, how many movies they make about them dying and going to heaven and coming back that's not what convinces the hearts of men. It's God's word that convinces the hearts of men. I've never seen anybody personally raised from the dead. I've never seen an overt miracle performed before my very eyes, and yet I believe him based on the veracity of his word, the power of his word, and the wonder of his word in my life. What it tells me about God, what it tells me about life, greater than some evidence of somebody trying to unearth an ark lost long ago or a rusted screen door with an image of Jesus. I say that one because when I was a young pastor in Port Natchez, Texas, there was a, a front door with a screen on it that it rusted in a way it looked like Jesus and people came from all over with candles and prayers and kneeling down before that old screen door because it looked like Jesus. Instead of hearing the words of God and believing. 
As Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that is believing. And we sang the words of the great reformer Martin Luther. He once said, the soul can, can do without everything except the word of God. Now what Lazarus found? The soul can do without everything except the word of God. Let me ask you, who was the rich man in this scenario? Who was the rich man in this scenario? I hope you all have the answer to that. Rich man, poor man. I want to be the one who's rich in heaven, don't you? Amen. Regardless of how this life goes. And because I'm an American, I've been very blessed, and so have you. Paul, like for us to sing.